Welcome to my fifth class about reinforcement learning, which is entitled Off Policy versus On Policy Reinforcement Learning. We have said in the previous class that SARSA was an on policy algorithm and Q learning was an off policy algorithm. The goal of this class is to understand more precisely what this means. In fact, this distinction matters a lot for deep reinforcement learning research because off policy algorithms like DDPG are generally more sample efficient but less stable than on policy algorithms like PPO. So it's important that you get the difference between two algorithms and here we will focus in the discrete state, discrete action case before switching to um, deep reinforcement learning case. So to get the distinction between those two concepts you need three objects. The first that's written beta of s it's called the behavior policy and that's the policy which is used to generate some samples from which the critic will learn um, the value of doing different actions. The second object is the critic itself. It is generally the value function v of s or the action value of function q of s a and here we will focus on the action value function case. And finally the third object is the target policy p of s which is used the the, to control the system in the exploitation mode. So the target policy is the policy we want to learn. So in practice we have an agent performing some trajectories we learn some critique from these trajectories and then we want to get some very good policy from this critique. Oh, so what does off policy mean in this context? I take a definition from this paper from my and colleagues. So they say that off policy learning refers to learning one way of behaving called the target policy from data generating from another way of selecting actions called the behavior policy. Okay, so, so that's exactly what I have said before. You have the behavior policy, you da generate data from it, and then you want to learn some target policy. And I have to um, <coughs> make you aware that there are two notions of, pol of policiness. There is the notion of of policy policy evaluation that I will treat immediately, but I won't cover seriously in this uh, class. And then there is the more important notion of of policy control on which I will focus later on. So what does of policy policy evaluation mean? Okay. The question is the following. Given that two different policies give rise to different value functions, so here I have the value function corresponding to following this policy, and here I have the value function corresponding to following the optimal policy in that particular maze. The question is, can we evaluate the critique of a target policy P of S, so those values, from playing a different behavior policy B of S? Quite obviously, if I am using beta of s, I won't get exactly those values. So the question is, can I correct the values um, given the difference between beta of s and p of s? And the point is that in this particular context, the target policy that I want to study and for which I want to know the critique does not need to be the optimal policy. And I have to know it in some way. And studying this notion of, pol of policiness is important, but I have to say that this is a weak notion of, of policiness and that I won't cover it anymore. If you want to know more about these things, you need to read the seminal paper of Doina Prekup about those things, and then more recent papers from, for instance, Remy Munoz um, in the context of deep reinforcement learning. So let's switch now to the off-policy control case, which is our focus in this class. What does this mean? The idea is that you want whatever your behavior policy, I mean I have having as few assumptions as possible on this behavior policy, you want to be able to learn a target policy which should be as close as possible to the optimal policy. One example would be learning a uh, deterministic target policy from stochastic policy behavior. So you get some stochastic agent which explores a lot and you want to learn a target policy which is deterministic, which won't explore anymore, for instance. Okay? And the point is that an algorithm, an algorithm might be set more or less on policy depending on the assumptions based on the uh, behavior policy. For instance, if the behavior policy is very close to the target policy, then your algorithm is not much of policy, whereas if it is very different from the uh, target policy, then it's very of policy. We will see this in more detail uh, 
very soon. Another important question is why would one prefer off policy control versus on policy control? In fact, the key is that off policy control provides more freedom for exploration. For instance, if your algorithm is off policy, you can get some samples from a human performing a particular task in an efficient way. Okay, and then from this human data, you can perform imitation learning to learn uh, effi an efficient target policy. Okay, but the assumptions on human data might be very different from the assumption that you have on your target policy. So the human-like policy might be very different. Okay. Another point is sample efficiency. In fact, if your algorithm is off policy, you can train your current policy based on data corresponding to previous policies that were play, played before. So you can store all the, all the samples from the very early policies into a replay buffer and reuse this data to learn your current policy, which is, of course, much more sample efficient than having to generate new samples each time you are learning a new um, current policy. And the third case where off-policy control is very interesting is when you are in a multitask context. In that particular context, in fact, you might use samples, generate samples to learn a particular policy for a particular task, and then reuse the same samples for learning a second task with a different policy. So you, you might, from the same set of data, if this data is rich enough, uh, learn several tasks with different policies from just the same data rather than using new data for each new task. And again, this improves a lot your sample efficiency. So this was about why doing off-policy control. Now, how will we approach the question of what does it mean to be off-policy in terms of off-policy control? So to study this question, I will reuse the three objects that I have presented before. But I will first have an open loop, uh, open loop approach where I will dissociate this learning process and this learning process. And then I will switch to a closed loop study where in fact I will reuse the target policy so as to generate new behavior policies. So in the first case, in the open loop case, I need a particular behavior policy. And I want one which makes as few assumptions as possible so as to make the process clear. And what I will do is use uniform sampling in the state action space. Um, if I am using this uniform sampling, one good point is that I won't get any exploration issue because on average I will try any action in any state very often. Okay. And also I have no bias toward gold samples. In fact, I am taking those samples uniformly so I can have as much good samples as bad samples. So if my algorithm works in that particular regime, then it's probably a good off-policy algorithm because it's, it does not need any assumptions on the, on the sample. But you have to be aware that using this uniform sampling set of samples, this does not correspond to an agent trajectory. So it's not truly a behavior policy. Okay? An alternative which would be truly a behavior policy would be to use random walk, but if I am using an agent performing random walk in a state action space, there might be some exploration issue because, for instance, the agent might get stuck for a very long while in a particular area on the state space and not explore the other part of the state space that we would like it to explore so as to be able to learn our target policy. So the idea is that I will take those uniform sampling samples and I, study, I will study critic learning just from these samples. And once I will get how good is my critic, then I will focus on extracting a target policy from, from that. Then once I will have studied this, I will close the loop and I will use the target policy plus some exploration as new behavior policy. And of course, if my target policy gets good due to a good critic, then I will get more good samples from my behavior policy. This will improve my critic, this will improve my policy, and again and again. Okay. But let's first focus on the open loop case. So to generate these open loop samples, I have first to define the sample itself. What I need to perform some update in my critique is samples which contain the current state, the current action, 
the current reward, the next state, and some action. Okay, and you will see that I will use different rules about the way to select the action at the next time step. Now, so in the case of uniform sampling, I will take some random state, perform some random action that will drive me to a different state, and then I will take a random action again. This will be my action alpha, alpha prime, sorry, A prime. If I have some samples written this way, then I can perform the update rule of my critique, which is the standard reinforcement learning rule, okay, where I update my Q values with some learning rate times the temporal difference error. And here, the temporal difference error will be drift written differently depending on the alpha prime that I am taking. In fact, there are three possible update rules corresponding to my three objects. Either in, I use information from the critic, so I will take alpha prime is the max, uh, is the best action given by the Q tables, so the, that's the argmax over A of Q of ST plus 1 A, and applying that particular value for alpha prime corresponds to using Q learning. Okay. Another possibility is to take alpha prime for my uh, behavior policy, okay? and that corresponds to what Sarsa would do. Okay. And the third possibility is to take alpha prime from the target policy. And this would correspond, for instance, to what DDPG would do. And DDPG is a particular actor critic algorithm, but there might be some different actor critic algorithms which would do something more similar to Q-learning, for instance. So this rule cannot be, um, cannot be said to correspond to any actor critic algorithm. That's the particular case of DDPG, for instance. So now let's have a look at um, how these algorithms work in practice with some videos. Um, to perform those videos, with respect to the previous mazes that I have defined before, I have added something unusual, which, has, which is that the agent gets a negative reward for hitting the walls. In fact, this negative reward will help, will help illuminate the difference between the on policy and the off policy case. This is just for didactical reason that I am using adding this negative reward. So let's have a look first at how Q-learning works. Okay, so let's start the agent. Okay. Now, as you can see, the agent, which is the blue thing, is jumping here and there because it's performing this uniform sampling. So it's not following a particular policy, it's just f jumping from state to state and taking random action. And as you can see quite obviously, each time it jumps somewhere where there is already some good value, then this, this value will propagate to where it was before. Okay. And you can see that consistently the values will improve from cell to cell as it is the case uh, in Q-learning. This is of course still quite slow because there is some learning rate which is a little low. Uh, but you can see that the values here start to propagate. So I will accelerate the video to go towards the end to show you that in the end you get something which is much better. And the more values you get, the faster the value propagation will uh, work uh, because each time you get a higher chance to take the best action in the next step. And you can see that here we are already close to 0 0.9, etc. etc. So let's go to the end. And okay, so what you can see in that in that particular regime, uh, Q learning works. Okay, as you have seen, Q learning performs quite well in this uniform sampling regime. And now let's have a look at Sarsa. Let's start again. So in the case of Sarsa, the agent is performing exactly as in Q learning. But here, what you can see is that. So I have already started to train before I started that particular video. You get some negative values here and there because your agent was hitting some walls from time to time. But as time goes on, due to taking a random action at the second time step, the values won't propagate to correct value. This may happen from time to time that a good value is propagated, but this is just by chance. And you can see that in that particular case, the negative values will propagate faster than the positive values, so the Q values won't get very good and the agent is not performing something optimal at all. 
So let's switch to the end and you can see that still in the end, no positive values was learned with this agent apart from here, but this is just by chance. This time, this is much less convincing. So now the point is to try to understand better why those differences between those different algorithms. So let's first detail what is happening with the Q-learning update rule. So we consider an agent which is moving from that state to that state. So we want to update the value of this action Q of ST80. Okay. And here we have the different values of the different actions in the next state. In the particular case of Q-learning, I will take my next action as the argmax of the Q values. So in fact, I will deterministically choose the action with the highest value, which is this one. Okay. So during my update, I will always backpropagate the highest value towards here using gamma times Q of this value. Okay. So you can see that, of course, this will consistently converge to the value of acting optimally because if you are, you are acting good here, then you will act optimally here and you propagate the value of acting optimally. And this will propagate to different states before and before this way. Okay. So you can see quite clear, clearly why Q-learning works well in that particular case because, in fact, it's ignoring the next action which might be taken randomly. It's taking the best action, whatever the behavior policy did before. Okay. Now let's have a look at Sarsa. In the case of Sarsa, the next action here is taken uniformly from uniform sampling. So the probability to take any alpha prime are uniform. So you get 50, uh, sorry, 25% for each possible action here. Okay. So in fact, the value that you will get here will be after many trials some average of the different values that you can get from here. So you can see that this does not converge to a high value corresponding to the uh, highest action, but rather it, this corresponds to performing some random walk. Okay. And the idea is that being greedy with respect to these values here won't result in the optimal target policy because those values are just moving as some average. Now let's have a look at how the third rule uh, works. So as a reminder, the third rule is the case where the second action is taken as the probability of action uh, provided by the target policy at the next state. Okay. As a reminder too, uh, this probability of taking an action at the next state evolves consistently with the action values at that particular state. So you can see that the probability to take this action is rather high, whereas this, the probability to take this one is lower and lower and even lower because this one has a negative value. Okay. Um, so the idea is that if you perform that action and then you select an action here, you have a higher chance to get an action with a high value than an action with a low value, okay? which is quite different from the Sarsa case where you have uniform probabilities for all these actions. But anyways, you still have a probability to get a very bad action, whereas you have a higher probability to get a better action. So if a good action is sampled here, you will increase the value here. But if a bad action is sampled here, you will decrease it. So finally, what you get here is some weighted average of the values of the next action, where the weights are consistent with the higher or lower values. So this update rule results in more structured fluctuation. Now what we want to know is what's the behavior of those three learning rules at a more global level. Here are the results. What is nice with those maze um, MDPs is that you can compute the optimal value function Q of SA. Okay. The optimal action value function, sorry. So here we obtain a drawing where we are using the videos that I have shown you. And we are just monitoring the difference between the current Q of SA and the optimal Q of SA. And you can see that in Q-learning, the difference goes to zero very quickly, it, which means that the Q values get optimal very quickly. Whereas with Sarsa, in fact, those values, uh, those values Q to SA that we are learning don't converge at, at all towards the optimal value. 
So Sarsa won't converge to, won't provide the optimal target, the, the optimal critique. And from this non-optimal target critique, you cannot get the uh, optimal uh, target policy, of course. And the surprise is that uh, with the third rule, okay, this does not work either. Okay, we could have expected that this third rule uh, would work more like this one, but slowly. But that's not the case. Which means that an algorithm like DDPG, in fact, is not truly of policy because if it's using uniform sampling as a behavior policy, it won't converge to any optimal policy. Okay, but beware that different actor critic implementation might behave differently. For instance, if in your actor critic your critic estimates v of s rather than q of s a, then the behavior would be more equivalent to the first rule, so it would be more equivalent to Q-learning. Okay. So that was the behavior in the case of uniform sampling. And the surprise what was that Q-learning was still able to converge to the optimal target policy. But that's not the case of SARSA and uh, the, the third algorithm, that which I called rule three and which corresponds to a kind of DDPG. OK? So does this mean that SARSA does not work at all? In fact, it's not the case. The point is that. In the standard case, you are closing the loop, so you are using the target policy as behavior policy, and this makes a very important difference because if your behavior policy is the optimal policy, then the, the second and third rule are absolutely equivalent. Okay, in fact, you are taking the max, okay, p of st plus one and beta of st plus one corresponds to p star of st plus one, so they are uh, the max. And in particular, in that case also, the Q values will also converge to the optimal Q values and rule one will be equivalent to. So you can see that if your loop is uh, closed and this has converged to the optimal policy, then the free algorithm will behave optimally. Okay. Of course, in the closed loop uh, context, Q learning will still work because it already works in the open loop context. And in the case of Sarsa and um, let's say DDPG-like algorithm, this works too, provided that the behavior policy will become greedy in the limit of infinite exploration. This has been proven in this particular paper. This means that if you are closing this loop and if you have some satisfactory exploration process, Im improving the critique here will improve your policy. Improving your policy will improve your samples, but from improved samples, you get an improved critique, which is will improve your policy, etc., etc. And finally, this policy will converge to the optimal policy, and then you will get the optimal samples, and you get the optimal critique. So it was shown in that particular paper that uh, Sarsa and actor critique converge, but they are not of policy because they won't work properly in the case where they are trained with uh, policy which is not greedy in the limit of infinite exploration. So this is the end of this particular class. If you want to know more, you can perform the labs that are available on this website. And you will, in this lab, find some notebook about off-policy versus off policy, on policy learning, which will allow you to do again the uh, videos that I have shown you in this particular class. Thank you for uh, your attention and don't hesitate to send an email if you want to ask more questions. Goodbye.